Hello, everyone, and welcome to our IEEE Young Professionals uh, webinar. Um, <clears throat> today, we have a very interesting webinar on uh, energy efficient data center power design uh, given by Brian Jens-Dester. Uh, I probably pronounced that incorrectly. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> but just before we get started, I have some, I have some notes. Um, today, uh, I'm your host, Matthew Carius. I'm the webinar special, specialist for the MGA Young Professionals Board. Uh, I'm also the Vice Chair for Communications and Marketing at the IEEE Young Professionals Global uh, Board. And in case you guys haven't noticed, we've been having monthly webinars in uh, 2015 on a variety of uh, uh, topics, including communication, leadership, and also some, some technical topics like today. <clears throat> uh, if you have any questions uh, to ask the speaker today, uh, you can ask them right on the bottom underneath our, our broadcast on our IEEE TV live page and all questions will be answered following the webinar in a 5 to 10 minute Q&A uh, session. <clears throat> in case you haven't noticed, uh, we uh, we have a new brand, a new name, new field, Gold to Young Professionals. Uh, actually, Gold was it instantly recognizable as a young professionals group, which is exactly who we are. And the new brand has been actually um, uh, very has been taken on very well. Uh, we've had a, a multitude of great net networking and uh, mixery events, and it's it's, it's actually been a, a, a very good thing. Uh, please check out our blog, Gold Rush blog, which uh, we will be revamping in the uh, couple in the coming months. <clears throat> Connect with us online. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Very active, actually, and even even on YouTube, almost a uh, hundred videos. Uh, we're going uh, I'm gonna be talking about some new career-based services we have for our young professionals uh, members at the end of the webinar. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Brian. He's a principal at Power Rocks. Uh, he's an expert in the, er in the area of power for enterprise, networking, server, and data center hardware. He has over 10 years of experience in many industry leaders, and he is now the principal of his own consulting company, uh, Power Rocks. So without uh, further ado, uh, uh, Brian, take, take it over. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, and just so you know, FYI, you're, you you got you got a bit of background noise there. Uh, I don't know if you have a shared meeting room, so okay, yeah, yeah, I'll just. Um, and the other thing I'll ask is since I'm I'm not viewing the the Google screen while I'm presenting, if someone pops up with a question, no problem interrupting me, but just uh, just let me know, or if you want to save it to the end, I don't care. Your your show. So uh, just just let me know. And uh, with that, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, as Matt said, I'm Brian Zonstecker. I'm running a power consulting company, Power Rocks, in the uh, San Jose, Silicon Valley area. Um, so let's, uh, let's get right into it today, and uh, hopefully you'll uh, learn something good about, uh, about efficiency in, uh, in data center hardware. Um, and, and, you know, the, the main point today, I mean, you, you'll see when I go through this, is that there's not a lot of, uh, you know, I don't have a, a lot of, I mean, not a ton of slides, not, not a ton of pictures and everything, because really a lot of this is conceptual. This isn't a, a, you know, step one, two, three, and this makes efficient uh, d hardware designs. It's really kind of an art. And so uh, I think that the key enabling thing, uh, particularly for young professionals entering the market, is to really have your mindset in the right place um, uh, with, with a power design philosophy in mind. So that's what I'm going to go through today and really kind of get you thinking. That, that, that's, that's my goal here. Um, so I want you to think, well, what does power efficiency really mean to you? Um, and then I say, where's the low-hanging fruit in power efficiency optimization? Um, you know, some, some things are are much bigger efforts and some things are actually not that difficult uh, or easily to uh, achieve power savings. Um, some trends, some design trends for networking equipment and then a little prediction, just you know, my, my, my prediction on how this will change in the next five years. Uh, we won't spend too much time on that and then some conclusions and time for Q&A. Okay, so what does power efficiency really mean to you? Um, and, and so the first thing I usually ask to think to think about is you know it may, a lot of people think of it as efficiency curves and in in particular they think of it as a peak point on an efficiency curve. When you hear uh, someone talk about a, a power supply or a system or whatever, you know they'll say it's 92% efficient, it's 96% efficient. Well, if any of you have ever looked at a at a an efficiency curve, it's just that. It is not a single point. 
right? It is it is efficiency showing the the efficiency um, versus load, um, and I'll actually have a, a couple curves to pull up in a minute. Um, but uh, I just want to make the point here that you know a, a peak point on a curve is is great for marketing and sales, but it's not what's going to make a difference to your system's power utilization um, or your bill. Which which uh, which really say think about the power bill, right? The utility bill, particularly the data center. For most customers, that's what really matters to them. And you want to do um, one of two things here. Um, I'm kind of jumping around, but like my third bullet says, do you want to do more with the same watts, or do you want to do the same with less watts? So in other words, do you um, want to lower your bill to do the same amount of work you're doing with your, your servers and your networking equipment and your data center, or maybe some, some like these mega data centers, you might hear about all the cloud trending and IoT application and all that. Um, these mega data centers, like the Facebooks and Googles and Microsofts of the world, they actually have such large data centers that they're, the power company caps them and says, we will not deliver any more watts to you, which means they have to do a lot more, they have to be more efficient with the watts they got. Um, so whether that's, um, you know, literally more efficient power by just more efficient power supplies, um, uh, there's... It, You'll hear me again and again come back to utilization and usage um, that I, I think is a far, um, far more effective technique. Um, and maybe they just want to be able to increase their power and compute density within the data center. So if they buy equipment that can run more in a smaller space, they can squeeze more in there um, or do more, you know, run more, um, you know, more higher efficiency systems with the same amount of watts. Um, really quick, I mentioned this, uh, the second bullet, power usage effectiveness, PUE. So this is an industry metric, um, and it's really like an industry metric for data centers in general because what it does is it, is it measures the, the total power coming into the building versus how much is dedicated to the data center itself. Um, so the closer to one you get with that ratio, right, is the more ideal. It means all the power being delivered to the building is going to the data center. And the higher that number is, um, that means that the more you're putting into overhead, basically. And so the takeaway message here is, um, you know, just kind of a rule of thumb, something to keep in mind whenever you're thinking about whether it's a system design at the board level um, or the rack level or even the data center level or a building level. Um, remember that, you know, depending on whose data you look at, roughly for every watt that you burn at the load, right, so at every, that you have to burn at the CPU or the, the memory or an ASIC or something right on the board for actual load, for every watt there, um, you, you have to generate somewhere between 2.5 and, and 4 watts total um, to support that 1 watt at the load. So that means that, you, that for every watt burned at the CPU, the utility is generating anywhere from 2.5 to 4 watts um, because of losses through transmission and you know all the the power conversion, um, as well as the infrastructure tying back to that PUE metric, um, you know the 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 cooling in the data center, the lighting, and and all this other stuff. So, um, not to preach too much, but just to say, power is your problem too. It's everyone's problem, and because I, I uh, there's a different talk I give called why everyone's a power engineer, whether they realize it or not. And, and the reason is, from any perspective, whether you're, it's not just a power or analog person or even just a hardware or EE, um, whether it's mechanical related to thermals, whether it's software um, related to coding efficiency, which, direct, which is directly uh, translates to power efficiency, um, or even business and uh, commodities people through, say, multi-sourcing um, or, or other assurance of supply practices or you know, there's all kinds of things that still relate to the success of the power supply, and nothing runs without power. Um, early engagement with team st stakeholders is absolutely critical. Um, this is something that, and, and I can tell you coming from uh, the OEM world, I, I used to work for HP and Cisco and Emerson Network Power, um, that in development, power stakeholders are not typically, you know, uh, deeply integrated into the development cycle, but once there's a problem later on, usually due to them not being involved enough in the beginning, then they're at the forefront, because again, nothing runs without power. And then the very last thing here says, what is the most efficient system? Well, I I'll tell you that the it's easy. The very, the, the top, the most efficient system in the entire world is one that's off. 
And the second most one is one that's utilized in 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 the way that uh, in the ideal spot in its uh, you know power load curve for where it's most efficiently designed. So here, and I'll come back to these two just just to again get you kind of thinking. Um, there's these two load curves, right? And and so if you're looking at these, and let's say these are load curves for a a front end power supply. So so this is the main you know let's just say the AC to DC power supply. Um, that that's on the front of a server rack or going directly into a, a, a piece of network equipment. So so if you were to look at this right where the where the x axis is the load from zero to one hundred percent right and the y axis is efficiency zero to one hundred percent, you'd say well which one of these is is the best one to choose for my application? And um, a lot of people might say might focus on the one on the left because you say, well, that one has a higher peak efficiency, right? You can see around 60% it has a peak efficiency in 95%, um, where around the same area in curve B, it's lower. Um, but what I can tell you is, is, is think about this, okay? Think about, well, the, one of the most important questions just to ask yourself, is this a redundant system? Is this an N plus one redundancy, which means it takes one power supply to support the whole system load, and then there's one redundant one as kind of a, a backup failover um, uh, or dual grid, but that's, that's another story. Um, but um, so what that really means is, and most serve data center applications have some level of redundancy. So if you're looking at two supplies in a system, um, they actually... Um, almost all the time they will they're meant to current share equally which means even if the system's at hundred percent max uh, you know with some margin built in so say that the actual system budget is usually on the order of 80 to 90 percent of the power supplies uh, you know budget full full power capability um, everything if there's two supplies sharing at 50 percent uh, that means that for one, you'll never a single power supply will basically never see greater than 50% load, um, you know, except for the failover condition or something, which is typically temporary. So that's not going to contribute to your, you know, your long-term power usage. So if you look at these curves again, think about at 50% load. That means that it doesn't matter how great the efficiency is above 50%. Forget 95%. This thing could be 110% efficient here. It wouldn't matter because it never operates there. And that's why you have to think of this not as peak points on a curve, but as you know, energy is 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 the integral under this curve, right? So so it, and that's where energy utilization is, and that's really what most power efficiency is all about, not a peak point in an efficiency curve. I want to keep drilling at home. So in reality, most servers, even high-end servers and everything, they're very large, right? If they share um, and they have even share against across more than two power supplies, um, that means that ideally they're they're shifting their load is shifting more towards the the left side of these efficiency curves, which means that the you know I would say in general the optimal place for just about any network power supply is actually in the you know 20 to 40 percent load range. So um, the the takeaway message from all this is that at the end of the day, curve B will actually have a highly significant power savings if you quantify that in dollars for the watts over time for high-end servers than curve A, even though curve A has a higher peak efficiency. So um, we talked a little bit about um, this, you know, so that's why I say it's low-hanging fruit uh, because power efficiency, it's all about utilization and where you operate, right? So so it's it, don't spend too much time in your power design or even if you're selecting a power supply of thinking I have to find the one that the spec has the highest peak efficiency on the spec sheet. Think about where you're really going to be operating in terms of your load and then think about what you can do to um, to optimize that. It's really analogous to, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with server virtualization and, and what that does is it's basically analogous to, to to power utilization in that server utilization just virtually takes loads that were restricted to uh, you know a, a hardware box and and says I can cut these into a bunch of virtual parts and I can even share them across multiple machines which basically takes away the hardware dependency um, on your server loads so you can consolidate all your little loads on that was on multiple servers onto many less 
servers, and then the ones you're not using, like I said before, what's the most efficient thing in the world? The thing that's off. Turn them off. Um, and so power, what kind of think of it as the same way in terms of efficiency, that you're, you're you know, find the most uh, efficient area of the load curve, uh, excuse me, the efficiency curve uh, uh, um, versus load, um, and then see what you can do to consolidate your loads to operate in that area. Um, so let's see, what do we have here? We talked about the uh, first bullet, second bullet, uh, third one, the myth of dollar per watt. This is just a quick one, especially for those of you that go into industry, um, and you'll face business and commodities folks um, who are not um, experts in, in power design, even power supplies, even though they, they own this specialized commodity. And so they have to, you know, especially business folks have to simplify it to, you know, to make business decisions. And typically a power supply is one of the highest dollar items in an entire server. So it is a big dollars around, you know, pennies matter. So one of the things they like to use is this metric of dollar per watt. And I say it's a myth because it's just silly. Um, they just want to easily, linearly scale. Um, it's just like it sounds, dollars per watt. So, you know, if you had a, a hundred watt power supply and it cost a hundred dollars, that's a dollar per watt. Um, <laughs> leading it, I mean, realistically in, in, the, in the industry, uh, the benchmark is really around seven or eight cents per watt. Um, but I said it's still a terrible metric that doesn't really make sense um, because what drives power supply costs a lot of time does not have to do with with purely the the power level or the powertrain um, and a good example of that is look at say the the you know what I call the wall wart right the, the wall adapter we all use say for our laptops and, and other devices say you have a you know a, a wall adapter that's around 100 watts you can imagine to, to actually make those things don't cost much at all right well under twenty dollars um, you know, actually in high volume, it's more like under five. Um, but if you had this a hundred watt power supply for a server that was in an enclosure um, that had a you know a higher end connector um, and 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 higher efficiency and all kinds of bells and whistles, um, the bomb cost for that could easily. I mean, the connector alone, the cost of that could cost more than your normal off the shelf uh, high volume uh, wall adapter. And so if you scaled that, it's to say, well, if I went from one server, a 100-watt power supply to a 200-watt one, if it costs more than double, then I'm getting ripped off. Well, no, that's not the case at all. Again, you really have to take into account the feature set and, and, and the protection features and, and all these other things. It's, it's not that simple. Um, power simulations have a lot of value. Um, they, uh, it, it seems like some, the, the software can seem, you know, it has a little bit of a learning curve. There's, there's different, many different tools. If you're interested in that, let me know. We can talk about that. Um, but basically, you know, even doing something like a simple, uh, there's great tools now that allow you to import your board, um, you know, your real PCB directly into simulation software. You can set up the loads and the sinks, and you can do, uh, you know, IR drop analysis, transient analysis, um, on the real geometry, and you can catch stuff easily through simulation uh, before you have to get that first proto board in, have it not work, and have everyone, uh, you know, on, on the power person for, for that. Um, uh, quick thing is embedded solutions versus modules. Um, certainly, uh, especially to get more experience with power solutions, um, you know, embedded or discrete designs, right? Thing, maybe you might have heard of down, called down solutions or onboard. Um, these are things that are built right into the board. Um, and um, are typically cheaper and uh, more efficient because you don't have the loss through a connector and other things, um, but they require more skill to implement, um, which is why you'll see a lot of folks, and if you look at boards, big boards, when you go around, pay, look at them and pay attention. See if you can pick out what the actual power part is. You'll see a lot of modules. So these are kind of pre-made um, uh, power solutions. In this case, I'm sorry, too, in the context of DC to DC. So we're talking DC to DC, um, isolated, basically like brick converters, as well as non-isolated, which make up the majority of the power supplies on a, on a big you know, server board or computer board or whatever. Um, so modules can be quick, off-the-shelf, kind of ready to go, um, but they, you know, they're certainly costlier, um, and you pay a price in terms of dollars and efficiency. Um, just really quickly here to go through some trends uh, for networking equipment. So one big one, in my opinion, is power over Ethernet. So this is something that's been around for a while. Um, so what's, what, what this means for 
uh, if you're not familiar with it, is um, that, uh, so I'm sure you, you know Ethernet, right, uh, the most common uh, networking uh, connection scheme uh, in the world. Um, you, you know, the same Ethernet you plug into your computer and whatnot. Um, well, there are um, special um, systems that enable sending power over the same exact cable that you send the data on. This is called power over Ethernet. And there's uh, uh, standards um, that that dictate uh, the, the max amount of power per line. And uh, that's been to 15 and 30 watts. And there's a new standard underway um, where they're actually talking about pushing upwards of, you know, almost 100 watts uh, per line. So um, if you're plugging this, say, into a network switch with all these Ethernet ports that support PoE, that means that all that power has to come from somewhere. Um, so that, that requires a, a major challenge in terms of uh, power management control um, in, in all aspects of the system, from the one that's controlling the power to the ports um, to the front end power supply um, that ultimately has to um, source all this power. Um, SOCs or system on chips, um, right? This is where, um, just like in the rest of the silicon world, um, you know, more and more things are being integrated. Um, uh, uh, as, as um, you know, kind of following Moore's law and as dyes shrink, you can integrate more and more um, onto a, a single chip. Um, and that's no different with power solutions. Uh, if some of you might have read about, like, the, um, for instance, the, the Intel Haswell processor, um, they actually kind of did an interesting experiment where they, they kicked up the switching frequency of their power supplies to the hundreds of megahertz, well into the VHF range, uh, very high frequency, um, and allow, doing so uh, allows you to greatly shrink the magnetics so that they can basically integrate them um, in, in uh, it's not totally monolithic, um, but it's something that, you know, the way Intel did, it's called a, like an MCM, a multi-chip module. Uh, for those of you in the packaging, sometimes it's referred to 2.5 or 3D packaging. But basically, the moral of the story is you're pulling the power from a power supply on the board onto the chip itself. And and uh, the uh, between uh, the, just what's going to enable that key technologies are the the ver the wide band gap switches that are coming out now. You know, you might have heard of gallium nitride, um, silicon carbide, aluminum nitride. And, you know, there's even things looking at diamond and other exotic materials. But the point is, there's things even closer. Ideal switches allow you to switch at such high frequencies. Um, you can you can shrink your your magnetics. Um, and you watched in you know. Over the years, you're going to see power disappear from the board. It'll be integrated into the ICs like everything else. Dynamic power allocation is a really um, key thing. Um, so what this means is so you have these power supplies all over, um, either in a single system or multiple systems, right, in a, in a rack or a data center. Um, so there are hooks in there that allow you to, um, you know, get the telemetry in real time and then actually, um, you know, turn off, power supplies, turn off power supplies, or shift loads um, in, in a way to be more efficient overall. Or, for instance, maybe you you, you were doing some highly uh, compute-intensive work, which required a lot of CPU power, and now you're doing something else that's for, um, you know, you, you want to share that or, or, or send it out through your, your networking stuff, so you require more, more memory and networking, so you can dial down the power on the CPUs and allocate that power to other places and other power subsystems so that you're more intelligently using the, the limited amount of front-end power you have so you don't have to over-provision that. Uh, current sharing, um, you know, I kind of touched on that before um, with, with, with redundant power supplies. This also occurs onboard power supplies, um, especially for multi-phase, non-isolated power solutions. Um, for instance, your processor power and almost everything uses multi-phase. Um, so it's using a bunch of smaller power phases that, um, that, that work together to provide the total load. And this also allows for that dynamic power allocation. Um, power, you might have heard of power shedding, which is dropping phases and then adding them back in on demand. This is also a, 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 a technique for improving light load efficiency. PMIX, or power management ICs. So because of the complexity of the power supplies around um, higher-end chips like FPGAs and processors and whatnot, um, you see the emergence of power management ICs. So these PMIX are basically integrating what was the onboard power solution into a pre-made kind of prefabbed um, power subsystem that, that usually comes
comes from the, the, the high-end chip folks because they, they know it's optimized to make their chip look good. High voltage DC, this is one you might have heard about in data center stuff. Um, so we're talking high voltage right on the order of a nominal 380 volt DC. Um, there, there's something, it, it, look into something like the Emerge Alliance if you're interested in this. Um, this is something that's been kicked around in the industry for decades, but it seems to be real serious this time, I'll, I'll say, um, is that the higher voltage um, power is now, the DC is going direct to the rack, and, it, and the whole point is that you eliminate some conversion steps and you get overall savings. Um, another important point, power supply is now hardware and software, particularly for high-end data center power. Um, almost any dense, you know, high-efficiency uh, high power supply has multiple microcontrollers in it and everything. So you need to treat it, you know, for the, the spec, it, it's not just a hardware functional spec, it needs a software functional spec too and collaboration with the system software team to work right. And with that comes the telemetry data, right? You get all, all the V's and I's and, and temp and fan speed and other cute things um, that come along with these, these neat hooks. So, um, most of this, I kind of this. A lot of this is reiteration, and I I won't spend much time, especially because I'm pretty much out of time. Um, but how are we gonna? What are the trends here? So more SOCs, more power SOC integration. Um, the power density will only continue to increase. Um, don't think a lot of people think that as overall efficiency increases, that that um, power utilization goes down. Wrong. Um, basically, the, the more people can use, the more they will use. The more designers will squeeze in the systems. So even though efficiency, overall efficiency increases, power density will always continue to increase. Um, there's an EMI impact, right? As we, especially as we shift to higher, uh, different switching frequencies, it totally changes the uh, electromagnetic interference or electromagnetic compatibility requirements. Um, more telemetry data you get, the more you can roll it up. If you have it at each subsystem on the, on the board, you can uh, roll that up to a system level, you can roll that up to the rack level, and even the, the data center level. And so um, a data, someone who's monitoring the data center can, can go in and out of that data, data at any level. So it allows for a lot of great uh, data aggregation and intelligent decision making. We talked about high voltage DC. And so, uh, and you kind of heard my, my predictions here, basically power is going to disappear from the PCB. Um, you know, 10, 20 years, I think it'll all be integrated to the point we won't even see a power supply on a board anymore. Um, lower mid-bus voltage, mid voltages or HVDC direct, this just means uh, eliminating intermediate uh, conversion power rails. Um, and then as power supply uh, efficiency overall improves, the less you, you have the need for something like forced air, um, or whatever cooling solution, water cooled, or anything like that. Um, so you have less less fans internal for the power supply. So take away, like I said, talk to your power person early. Whether you are that person, you have to make a, you have to go above and beyond to really push your team to to include you early on. Or talk to them if you're if you're not a power person. Um, the earlier engagement, the better. Think about utilization, not if not efficiency, not a point on a curve the area under the curve. Um, remember, saving one watt at the load has a tremendous impact through everything, right? That, that Remember that metric of two and a half to four watts have to be generated for every watt at the load. And cost is feature-driven, not power-driven. Right? Remember that dollar per watt thing, the myth of it. This, this is what that means, that it has a lot more to do with your, you know, your, like I said, the, the stuff around it, the, the connector, the, the chassis, the protection features, um, not just the power level. So with that, uh, I thank you, and I'll uh, open it up uh, to, to Matt on the floor for questions. Thanks for a good talk, Brian. Um, I have a quick question before I hand it off to anyone else. Sure. Uh, you have a, what, 10 years experience, I'm HP and all these huge <laughs> companies. How do you actually um, convince the marketing guys that, oh, no, we have to run at this load and not this load. Don't don't look at this dip. Like, like you mentioned, how do you actually convey that message. I know you tried to do it here rather quickly, but how do you do it to a marketing guy that is has no you know, you know no no <laughs> technical savvy at all? Well, you you hit the nail on the head, right? No technical savvy. So the the real key thing that I've learned is know your audience. And remember that to to be successful and to enable your your solution, right? There's a there's a multifunctional team and, and a cross functional team that involves all kinds of not just engineering and technical folks, but business, marketing, manufacturing, commodities, um, program managers, and so you, 
you know, I mean, as opposed to attacking that one specific one, because you know, like it, it would it would take hours. <laughs> um, well, what I the general advice I'd say is get to know each stakeholder and find out what's important to them, what drives them, um, and then what you can do is once you understand that, um, then you can learn how to take whatever you know argument you're trying to make or convince them of, and see if you can try and put it in in a context that speaks to what drives them, right? So, for instance, if it's commodity manager, um, all they care about is cost, right? Reducing cost. So you could tell them about pay one penny more and it's and it, you get the coolest features ever and it saves the customer all this money. And frankly, they don't care because what drives their paycheck and their bonuses is cost reduction. Now, if it's that marketing person, right, it's all about making the product look good and, and, and gaining more... Um, points with the customer. So they're going to be interested in things like those peak points on the efficiency curve um, as a selling point, but but at the end of the day, their customer is still going to ask, why isn't it making a big difference to my power bill? Um, as, as we talked about, the kind of the, the myth of the, the peak um, and why that's more marketing and sales than it is real power savings. Um, so as a designer, um, you, you can't make them, you know, they're, all the other architects and everything, they're going to tell you what loads they want in the system, right? What chips to support and how much CPU and memory and, and networking and all that. So it's not like as a power person you'll get to dictate that at all. But what you have to do is do a good job of getting as real a, a characterization information you can in all those individual parts, putting that together and finding the most intelligent way to architect a power subsystem. Perfect. Good, uh, good answer. Um, I just have one last question coming in here. Can you give more examples of how software is going to be playing into the whole uh, power efficiency game in, in the next coming years? Oh, absolutely. And and I want to make a, a keen correction to that, if I heard it correctly, is that you referred to that in the future tense, and, and I want to make it clear that it's well in the past tense, uh, in the present tense, and has been in the past tense for, you know, a, a decade at least. Um, especially the higher end supplies and the denser they get, um, they've gone to almost all um, full digital uh, implementations, which um, it's, I mean, the full topic is too big to get in here. Basically, digital power, um, not just as a wrapper uh, for telemetry, but actual digital control. So it means that there's DSPs or some other micro in there that's actually controlling the, the power control and feedback loops. Um, for the power supply, and there are multiple ones in there. Typically, something in your front end, say if it's AC to DC for the you know the boost converter and the the the, the power factor correction, the PFC front end, and then the main DC to DC section. Um, and depending on the topologies, can depend on how um, intensive the how how much control is in the um, you know those micros and and how much software is required. Um, also for the protections. Right uh, for overcurrent, over voltage protection, short circuit protection, over temperature, um, and, and telemetry data um, is important because it all feeds back. Right now, the, the power supplies are intelligent, so not only do they control themselves, but they talk to the system, and the system talks back to them. So to give an example, the system can tell them to can it can command a power supply to turn down its fan speed if it doesn't think the cooling is necessary, saving overall power. Um, or maybe it's for acoustic reasons, but anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, but anyways, th the point is that software um, is is playing a larger and larger role, um, but it's already absolutely key. Um, and because most power supplies have you know microcontrollers and and upgradable firmware and all that, just like just about anything else these days, um, it, it, I want to reiterate the importance of of making that, you know, on that design team, you know, when I was talking about the stakeholders, you know, even in my experience working with, with some of these top guys in the industry um, who've been using these types of power supplies for years, even then, these system software and firmware folks um, are really kind of far removed from the power supply. They kind of think of it as, like most folks, ah, it's, it's, it's power stuff, let the power guy handle it. Um, but the fact is, is that's a major disconnect that causes real problems time and time again, uh, almost in every development I've ever seen, um, because of that disconnect between um, the software development team um, helping on the front end with writing, say, like you know, a, 
as you mentioned, a, a functional spec to make sure that there's a software spec that goes along with the hardware spec for the power supply. But then also when you get your first protos back, realizing that all that software and interaction with the system has to be validated at these you know, the system software level. And that's typically something that the power supply person isn't even enabled to do. Um, you know, uh, it's aside from just making sure that the, 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 the power aspect of the power supply is correct and validated, interactions with firmware and system firmware are kind of beyond the capabilities in those power folks. Um, I don't, not just mean technical capabilities, but even just their resources. Um, and so it requires that that the system team, uh, the folks qualify and focus on the power supply firmware just like they do the system firmware. But in reality, it doesn't happen much. So what you can do, um, as a young professional coming out of driving this, is making sure from the day from day one at system inception that you know even if they don't want to hear it, you have to push to make sure that software folks are involved in a software spec. You can't throw it over the wall to them. Um, but you need their buy-in to make sure that whatever you're calling out as a specification for the power supply will, will um, you know, that it jives with the, the system software and firmware that it has to interact with. That's a very, a very thorough answer. Answer. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not for giving far too thorough answers. <laughs> Whatever you heard, I promise you it was a short version. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, well, we don't have any more uh, questions coming in, so I'd like to thank you, um, uh, Brian, for an excellent talk. Um, All right, thank you. It was my pleasure. And uh, again, my, um, my, uh, my contact information, uh, particularly my, my email, my phone, um, powerrocks.com. Anyone's welcome to, to visit, to shoot me questions or whatever, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to help. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so for, the, for those of you participating, please complete our feedback survey. Our next webinar is going to be held on June 16th. It was postponed uh, from Maricel Ramos and Stacey He from our personal finance webinar series part two. So it will be on June 16th. Please check out our career-based services, our mentor center, our resume lab. And for any comments or suggestions, just uh, send us an email. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, until next time.